Welcome to today's webinar, Combating Invasive Insects, brought to you by Landscape Management and our sponsor, Safari Herbicide by New Farm. I'm Joelle Harms from North Coast Media, digital producer for Landscape Management Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. The recording will be available two weeks from today on our website, landscapemanagement.net slash webinars. A link to the on-demand recording will also be emailed to you when it is available. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you in which the ways you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice the Submit button in the lower left-hand corner of your console. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in queue. Questions that were submitted during registration may be covered in this webinar. Some questions may also be answered in an upcoming issue of Landscape Management Magazine or in our weekly e-newsletter, LM Direct. We strive to answer as many of your questions as possible. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, select Help to submit your issue and assistant producer Diane Sopranic or I will personally assist you. Now I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, Landscape Management Editor-in-Chief, Marisa Palmieri. Thank you, Joelle, and welcome everyone to the 2014 series of Build Your Business webinar. Today's topic is Combating Invasive Insects, and we have two great speakers lined up to cover both the technical and operation sides of the service area. And also we have to um, first thank our sponsor, New Farm and Safari Insecticide, um, for making today's webinar possible. And we have Joe Chamberlain, Manager of Field Development for the Professional Products Group on the line from New Farm to say a few words. Hello, everybody. I'm glad you could join us. I'm actually still with Valent, but uh, we do have two great speakers today, and I really appreciate uh, Landscape Management for uh, putting this series on. Thank you. Thanks, Joe, and sorry about that, um, both on the company name. Um, first, first up, we have Jim Besky from the University of California Cooperative Extension, and Jim has both a bachelor's and master's degree in entomology from the University of California, Riverside. His research emphasizes pest management methods against common ornamental plant pests and insecticide resistance issues. He's been involved in eradication and management of invasive pests and their regulatory effects on nursery and greenhouse production in California. And then on the um, operations practitioner side, we'll have Rex Bastian, regional technical advisor for um, the Care of Trees slash Davy Tree. And Rex joined the Care of Trees in January of 1989 after receiving his PhD from Iowa State, majoring in entomology. His emphasis is on education and training, public relations, and diagnostics. He is an ISA Board Certified Master Arborist, and he currently serves on the ISA Board Certified Master Arborist Test Committee. Thank you both for participating today. We're really looking forward to what you have to say. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jim for his presentation. Thank you, Marissa. Hi, my name is Jim Bethke, and like Marissa said, uh, my expertise is in ornamental plant production, but I also deal with a lot in the landscape as well. It kind of overlaps a little bit since a lot of the plants go into the landscape. And what I want to talk about today are the, here is the presentation outline, are the well, who's on the front lines as far as finding these invasives go. Uh, I want you to take a look at assessing the risk, the risk to the landscape or to the plants, and then I, I can't talk about any of this without talking about a little bit in IPM. So I'm going to just mention IPM briefly, and then lastly, I'll get into chemical control. I want to concentrate on just a couple of things. One of the sap suckers, meaning the piercing sucking insects, and of course, I'm going to talk, touch, touch on the neonicotinoids uh, when I talk about the, uh, those feeding insects, the uh, sap sucking insects, and then the boring beetles, which are also a real serious problem, and they're spreading across the country like crazy. Uh, many different kinds, and I, I can't get real specific with each kind, but I can at least talk about them in general. And then um, maybe a little bit about chemical injection and ke other types of application methods. So first of all, I, I want to emphasize the fact that landscapers are really out there on the front lines. You know, in, in ornamental production, a lot of people aren't thinking about the invasives until they show up in their production facility. 
but the landscapers go to a lot of different homeowners' yards and so on and see a lot of different things. Even the homeowners, the landscapers and homeowners are really right out there on the front lines. They'll see things before any regulator or anybody else does. So I want to encourage you, the fact that you are out there on the front lines, it should help us with reporting some of these invasive species. I've got a couple of websites there that you can take a look at. And one of them uh, literally will give you a list of all the states. Here's a list of most of the states there. They're all a link. They're a hyperlink. So if you click on a state, it will give you an actual list of, of websites that you can go to or organizations like are shown here that you can click on and then report something that you think is a very serious pest. It really helps all of us out in trying to capture these things before they get way out of hand and they become a very serious problem either in the landscape or in agriculture in, in each state. Now, the very first thing I think that's really important is you really have to assess the risk. As far as the regulators go, they, the first thing they want to do is prevent it from even coming in and invasive. But the, they also want to eradicate. So if something does come in, they want to eradicate it, and then they don't have to think about it anymore. But lastly, if it comes in and it looks like it's established, they have to contain it or try to contain it. And uh, in order to do this, they have to assess the risk of this pest. Is it really ne Does it need to be prevented? Does it need to be eradicated? Do we need to contain it? And how do we manage it? Because lastly, it's going to be managing the problem once it gets into the landscape. So first, you look at the potential for a species to be harmful, both ecologically and economically, and some, sometimes even socially. There'll be a social impact, and I'll talk about one of those a little later. So what the regulators do is they do a pest risk assessment. They look at the magnitude of the resulting harm potential by this invasive. They'll even do it before the invasive makes it here. They'll do a pest risk assessment. And uh, there are natural enemies. Are there natural enemies that will attack this insect in the range that they come from and in the range that they've moved to? Are there environmental conditions that are really important that will constrict their movement? Are they just a, a nuisance pest? Or are they, could they be a very serious pest or an agricultural pest or a vector of a disease that will destroy some landscape or a tree or whatever? So I'll give you some examples of that a little later. Uh, obviously, what are the economics? Because a lot of times the regulators and the states and this, even the APHIS, the uh, federal government, will not have enough funds to deal with every one of these invasives and can't handle them. And so you may have to be the one that's going to be dealing with it. So you need to uh, assess those risks as well in the landscape that you're trying to deal with. So I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples. The ficus white fly, it, it made its way to Florida. It ended up being a very serious problem. In, in Florida, it, 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 it attacked the ficus ranges. You can see a couple of the pictures. There. The one in the middle, you have ficus that's a, actually a border between properties. And there's a lot of places, even here in California, that are like that, where the ficus is used as a border because it grows very densely. And it's a huge, they could be huge trees, like a picture on the right. But the problem with this insect is it will defoliate the whole darn thing. And so you could actually lose the plant with enough defoliation over time. You could lose these plants. They will die. This is serious enough that they need to be dealt with. Well, now it's in California, and it hasn't done this yet, but it, it is expanding its range. It's in San Diego and in Los Angeles counties, so we have to think about it and we have to deal with it. Another pest like that is a spiraling whitefly. Now, that's in Florida, so we fully expect to get that in California. I'm sure it may spread itself to other areas in, in the United States, Texas maybe as well, the southern states potentially. But this one's even more serious. So here you can see a couple of, of different kinds of plants. It has a larger host range. The ficus whitefly attacks ficus, so it's basically one plant. But this one has a larger host range, and it attacks many different kinds of palms. And the, the, the two photos here, you have gumbo limbo on the left and then a, an, a, an areca palm, I think. No, it's a coconut palm on the right. They're white, not because it's snowing. They're white because they're covered with so many white flies. Literally, this, if there's enough white flies on these plants, they will defoliate and kill these plants. And the secondary problem is that they produce an enormous amount of, of honeydew or the, the sweet juices that are shot off of these white flies down onto the ground. So they could be a political problem as well. And we had that exact problem happen here in California with the, what's called the tipu psyllid, where uh, they were not a problem anywhere until they reached Hollywood and the 
the raining honeydew landed on Mercedes Benz on the street corners, and all of a sudden it became a social problem, and the politicians got involved. We need to deal with this, and then they needed to be dealt with. So it just gives you an indication that it can affect us in many different ways. Now, here's another example, and this is important uh, to point this one out. The citrus root weevil. Okay, we know that it is a very serious pest on citrus, but it's also got a very large host range, so it will attack a lot of landscape. It will eat the roots of those plants, and they'll die, and most people won't even know why those plants have died. It's mostly because the roots are gone. So it, it has been, been in Florida for a very long time. It's been in California for a while, but here's the big thing. There was a gigantic issue of dealing with this in citrus and in the landscape in Southern California. The orange areas that you see on the map there is where the original infestation was back in 2005, 2006. Well, we've reassessed this area. It's still exactly in this area, and it's because the environmental conditions doesn't allow it to spread north or east, and so it's going to stay in this coastal range and so now we have to deal with it in this coastal range. And the parasitoids won't attack it in the coastal range because the parasitoids need a warmer envi environment to really take off. So here's a different in, uh, situation as far as the risk of this pest. It's not going to move. It's not going to be a real serious problem. Here's another one. The Ligurian leafhopper feeds only on one plant, just on the rosemary, basically. And oh, so rosemary is a problem, and it can be an ornamental, it can be an herb, it can be in landscape. But it's one pest on one plant that can be dealt with. On the other hand, we have the glass ring sharpshooter, which is another leafhopper. Now, this one everybody ignored for 10 years until they found out that it was transmitting diseases to an enormous number of our landscape trees and plants. Oleanders began to die in, in one of our counties here. Then all of a sudden in another county, the huge sweet gums began to die. Uh, we have, and right now in San Diego County, we have the olive trees dying. So you can see that the seriousness, the uh, risk of this pest is much more serious than the Ligurian leafhopper and needs to be taken seriously and needs to be controlled. So the, the only thing I want to say about IPM is, first of all, you have a lot of natural enemies out in the environment already. It, it re buying or releasing natural enemies in the environment, in a landscape, is very difficult, and it is also not as successful as you would suspect. It's not as successful as an ornamental production or in a greenhouse or in other areas where you can release them, uh, like in ag where it's a monoculture and so on. The landscape's a little different, a little more difficult. So to release a whole bunch of beneficials on one tree in somebody's yard, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So in using IPM to help control some of these invasives makes a lot of sense. Eucalyptus beetles and eucalyptus psyllids, and if you protect that plant by giving it a better uh, conditions to live in, the health of the plant, it's going to do much, much better. So overwatering and underwatering, over-fertilizing and under-fertilizing, or improper mowing and pruning, are, are very common problems that will stress plants and cause very serious pest issues. So taking care of the plant to begin with is going to save a lot of the problems uh, from pests that will occur from the pest. So being again, being the landscaper, if you're involved in both the pruning or the fertilizing or the watering of these plants, uh, then you need to make sure that it's done properly for each plant in, in the environment. The other thing that's kind of important is you want to monitor for these pests. So even if it's an invasive pest and serious pest, if you monitoring means, all right, they're present, but are they causing damage to the plant? Are they a nuisance in some way? Uh, are they transmitting a disease? Or you know, you, are they being uh, attacked by a beneficial and being killed already? So do you really need to do any kind of uh, pest control measure on those landscape plants? So I, I'm saying here, again, in the third bullet, is use all the available IPM methods before you use your chemical control option and then get to the chemical control option. And when you do, consider the most environmentally sensitive approach first unless it's something very significant like what we've just talked about. So there are many different places online that you can get some IPM recommendations. Both uh, here are some options and some ideas on how to control or protect the plant or make a better plant or choose a different plant in your landscape, if you go to UCIPM online, and there's the link there, you can actually literally pick your crop, pick your landscape, pick your plant, 
and pick the pest as well, and it will give you all the information that you might want to know about those pests and how to deal with them before you start using the pesticides. It also has pesticide recommendations on there as well. Okay, so now let's, let's talk a little bit about the chemical control. And so now you're going to deal with something in the, in the environment, and the most common pests out there that are causing serious problems are the piercing-sucking insects. They feed on the vascular system of the plants. It doesn't matter what kind of plant it is. You have the monocots, like even a palm tree or the grass, but you have deciduous trees. You have woody ornamentals. You have herbaceous plants in the garden. There's a lot of things that are all mixed in in the landscape. So the piercing sucking insects are probably the most common and the most serious of the pests that are out there. So that's what I wanted to concentrate on with uh, some control measures. The white flies, mealybugs, aphids, adelgids, scale insects, psyllids, leafhoppers, and plant bugs all have stylets that go down into the plant, either herbaceous or woody or grass or whatever, and f search for either the phloem or the xylem to feed on. Those that feed on the xylem are not producing the sweet juices when they when they uh, defecate. So in other words, the ants like the sweet juices of the mealybugs and the aphids. Uh, the, the other, well, things like leafhoppers will feed on the xylem, and what they poop is more like water than it is the sweet juice. And the controlling them is very different as well. You have white flies on the undersides of leaves. Mealybugs are in the cracks and crevices and very difficult to get to control, uh, get control measures too. The uh, scale insects are, are seasonal and they're protected by a cover. The hard, sca hard scales especially, the armored scales, have a covering on them, so contacting them with pesticides is very difficult. So knowing their seasonal habits to kill the, the immatures or the smaller stages as they crawl, those are where you're going to really make your efforts. Then there's the leafhoppers that are very difficult to contact as they will hop or fly away from treatments, or they will go on the other sides of the branch where you can't see them and treat them. So how do you deal with these uh, when, when there are so many different kinds and it's very difficult to contact them? You poison their food source. More or less, you, you get the toxicant to their food source. And using systemics is an excellent way of doing that. And there are very few really out there anymore, the neonicotinoids, and there's a couple of organophosphates like orthine that are very systemic. But the neonicotinoids are incredibly uh, it's a new generation of insecticides, incredibly beneficial because they will conserve a lot of beneficials that are out there feeding on some of these, uh, these pest insects. And so by using the systemics and getting into their food source, you're not having to worry about contacting them in the cracks and crevices of the plants or so on. They're feeding on, on, the, on the toxicant. The, what I mean by conserving the beneficials is that if they're feeding on the toxicant, well then then there are insects that may not have gotten the toxic dust that may be fed upon by the beneficials out there. There's a lot of con controversy about that. Well, what, if the insect has been killed by the, by the toxicant, then does it affect the beneficial? Uh, that's, that's fine. It may, and there, are, there is some data for that, but it doesn't matter. You're still allowing the potential for the beneficials to help out with the control of some of these pests. There are other effective modes of action against the piercing sucking insects, and those include the selective feeding blockers. So there are insecticides that will, if you spray them on these insects or they come in contact with a feeding blocker, it, they, they may stay alive for a while, but they're going to starve to death because they have stopped feeding. So even if they want to pierce and suck the, the plant, they can't and won't. And th so those are really good insecticides and good choices as well. Lastly, you have the broad-spectrum insecticides. The safer ones for the environment are the soaps and oils, of course. But the products like the organophosphates and the pyrethroids, the broad spectrums, will kill not just those pest insects, but everything else as well. So you've kind of disrupted the whole environment, the whole ecology, even in a landscape, by using some of the broad spectrum. There, there may be no other choices for some of the pests in your environment that you have to use these for, but for the piercing sucking insects, you want, I would recommend more of these targeted pesticides like the neonicotinoids. Okay, so now let's talk about the beetles quickly, and then I'm going to start, uh, give you some examples of uh, what I'm talking about as far as using the neonicotinoids and some of the pests that, that we have to control. The boring beetles 
there are many different kinds. Many of them come from one family of beetles, the bark beetles, the, the, but there's also another one too, the, the elaterids, the, or not the elaterids, the ones of the longhorn beetles. So there's boring beetles, the longhorn beetles, and shorthorn beetles, and then you have the bark beetles and all damage trees. And you have lots of examples of all of them. Right now, the, the emerald ash borer is probably the best example. Everybody knows about the emerald ash borer. Uh, that one is a, 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 the round-headed borer. We have the flat-headed borers, which are longhorn beetles. They can all attack the trees through the bark, feed on either the cambium as an immature stage, and then go into the hardwood or, or go right into the hardwood. So they can cause an enormous amount of damage. When they feed on that cambium layer or the, the transporting layer of the, of the plant, the vascular part of the plant, now they stand the potential of literally killing a plant, a tree or any other kind of plant, trees, bushes, or whatever. So there's lots of examples, the bark beetles, the ambrosia beetles, the powder post beetles, and some weevil species that can actually get in and bore inside some of the big trees and palms as well. So the, the, again, uh, some of the better products to control these pests are the systemics, uh, the neonicotinoids. And one of those, the, obviously, they use Safari or Dinotefran uh, for control of the emerald ash borer, and they also rec recommend imidacloprid, another uh, neonicotinoid for control of the emerald ash borer. Getting it into the plant, I'll talk about how to get that in there in a little bit. Uh, this is a mistake. It says other effective modes of action should not say selective feeding blockers, so I apologize for that. I'm just going to move on to the broad spectrum. Now, what am I talking about with the broad spectrum insecticides? I'm talking about a preventative application, meaning if you spray the tree before the beetle lands on it to lay their eggs, you're either going to repel the insect or kill the insect as it lands on that tree. And so now they're not going to lay eggs, or when the eggs laid, the, when they hatch, they'll die because they've come in contact with the broad spectrum insecticide. So there's two methods of, of control for these beetles. It's to wart them off or, and kill the adults as they're laying eggs, or you attack the immature stage in the, in the cambium layer in the vascular system of the plant. So we'll, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. So let me go through uh, the application methods. Now I'm talking, uh, if I'm thinking about a tree and about some of these boring beetles and talking about the beetles, there are many methods that you can use. Obviously, aerial or aircraft, uh, there have been examples of that here in Southern California, probably in other areas as well. The spray application is probably the one of the more common methods of dealing with things using a gun-type spray, or even all the way up to the large parts of the canopy of a tree. However, there's a lot of disadvantages to using spray applications like that, especially if you're in a landscape where a lot of people can watch you do this. So, that's not a real uh, smart way of doing it, but it is an option that is available. The best way to deal with it is the targeted applications. And the systemic applications, again, are, are, the, are pro some of the best uh, uh, potentials for control of some of these major invasive pests. The root zone drench is one way to get a systemic application in. That's a pretty common way you're going to drench the soil around the canopy of the plant in the soil, getting to the roots, it goes directly into the roots and right up into the plant. The root zone granular, so if you have a granular application around, again, the root zone, the granular breaks down slowly and slowly emits the, the chemical into the root zone, and the roots pick it up and take it up into the plant. The trunk application is another method. There, there's new labels for app, applying a pesticide directly onto the trunk of a tree or a plant or woody ornamental. And the, the way to do that is literally paint it on or spray it on in a small area on the tree. And it, a lot of these neonicotinoids are very soluble and will go right into the, the vascular system of the plant through the bark and right up into the tree. I have had great success with that with some of the invasive here in Southern California. Soil injection is another way, um, putting a hole in the ground at just different areas around the tree and injecting a certain amount of pesticide that, again, will be picked up by the roots. Not as effective because it's not always doesn't always go up evenly all the way into a, a larger tree. And lastly, you have trunk injection, and there are many different methods now of trunk injection, and a couple of new ones as well. Some passive methods and some active methods of injecting pesticides right into the cambium or the first couple layers of the xylem in in a tree to go right up the trunk, right up into the into the plant. 
the, the disadvantage of that is that you do have to do some damage to the plant. So you're going to poke that tree. Uh, a lot of trees will protect themselves and, and be able to heal themselves very quickly, but I've seen a lot of damage on a lot of trees from trunk injections. It is very effective, though. I have to mention that. All right, so quickly, there are many different examples here. This is the agave mealybug. Now we have a different kind of plant. It's a succulent, and it's a mealybug. So how do you deal with a mealybug? You could use your sprays to break down the waxy layer and, and try to contact that mealybug. It may be very difficult to do that. If you want to put the toxicant next to the insect so that it can, where it's feeding, does the succulent pick up the neonicotinoids? We're doing that research right now here in Southern California to find out the most effective method. We're getting a lot of succulent calls, a lot of agave calls about mealybugs on, on their plants and issues, and it is an invasive pest as well. The branch birch borer is another good example. It's a boring beetle. It, it feeds on the cambium layer, but it will also then go into the hardwood, so you want to get it when, in its early stages when it's feeding on the cambium or the first two rings or the xylem of the of the tree. There are two methods of control. You want to prevent that adult or you want to apply the pesticide like a neonicotinoid at the feeding layer for the larvae. So there's two ways to deal with those. This is just another example. This one I wanted to talk about quickly. The micropate species is a false powder post beetle. There's powder that you can see on the leaves there in that tree. You can see a hole in that branch that's sticking straight up there's several holes there. That's the beetle. They push the, the powder out of there that they're feeding on the hardwood. But we were able to solve this, solve this problem for this grower by painting the trees with safari or dinotefran at the lower level of the trunk, right near the crown of the plant. And it went right up into the tree, right up into these small branches, and it kills these larvae feeding on these uh, small twigs. And we were able to help the grower with the with that, uh, that invasive pest so that they were releasing their plants. Now, this is our latest real problem, very serious problem, this little prolificus shaholbar. It's a very tiny beetle. They, they have a fusarium that's associated with them. This fusarium then will help kill the plant. And so let me give you a quick look at what this looks like. You can see the black areas and the dark areas inside this plant, this tree. And you can see the bark, you can see the cambium layer, and then the hardwood and they're feeding down there in the hardwood, but all that dark area, no water or anything is going to move up into the top part of that plant. So a neonicotinoid isn't going to really work there because it's not going to go up. If you inject it into that area, here's the other issue. They feed on the fungus. They don't feed on the, the, the woody tissue. They're eating the fungus, the actual fungus. So now we're, we, have a, we can't get the toxicant to their food source. So this is a real serious problem for us. And here's just another shot. You can see a couple of adults running around there in the galleries that they cause on the trees. We're losing an enormous number of avocados. And here are the, our box elders are dying like crazy uh, due to this. The, the wetted area on the trunk and that white little volcano is very characteristic of this beetle. So here's an invasive that we're taking thousands of trees out in Southern California for, and we have no real good pesticide solution for at the moment. So in conclusion then, Remember that you guys are on the front lines. You should assess the risks of these pests on the plants before you do any kind of application method. Is it really causing a serious problem or not? Are the beneficials already killing the pest? Do you really need to deal with it? And then try to use all the IPM techniques first. Lastly, if you're going to use the chemical control of invasives, know that pest very, very well in all the aspects of it so you know where to target those pesticide applications. And I really think the systemic applications are the way to go at the moment, and they have the least effect on the beneficials in our environment at the moment. So, and I will leave it there, and I'll get to questions in a little later. Great. Thank you so much, Jim. That was a great presentation. We really appreciate it. And yes, um, to the attendees, if you want to make sure you type your questions into the chat box, and we'll address them at the end. Um, so with that, we'll bring up Rex Bastian from um, The Care of Trees to talk about um, his perspective as a practitioner on managing invasive insects. Rex? Thank you, Marissa. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. OK, all right. My computer is running very very slow it's been lagging on so we shall 
see what we can uh, what we can do here. I'm going to speak a little bit uh, for those of you that are listening. I'm located in the uh, Chicago metro area, and having worked in the tree industry for approximately 25 25 years, uh, I've got you know quite a bit of experience with running into different things and dealing with a lot of different arborists and clients and everything else uh, involving some of these introduced insects. So I would like to begin, are my, are my slides showing up? On the screen? Um, what looks like, here we go, here's your, if you want to hit next, then you should be able to go to your uh, first Yeah, slide. I've been hitting it, but I'm getting a little spinning circle here, so here, let me that makes me think uh, about halfway through the presentation, things really started to slow down. Okay, it's on your first slide. If you want us to push the slides for you, just, just let me know, and then I'll... Okay, so it is on, it is on the first, which one is it reading, because it's not showing up on my computer? Detection of invasive insects is the one. Okay. All right. Um, from that point, I've always wanted to make sure that you as the arborist or the field manager or the person that's actually out in the field, you have to be knowledgeable about what you should expect in your area in terms of these invasive insects. In other words, you have to be aware of what could potentially show up. And in order for you to in order for you to do that, you have to once again be paying attention to what's happening in the industry. Now, most of you that are listening on to, listening to this webinar are going to be on the front end of that because you've shown enough interest to log on to something that's talking about these invasive insects. But from a practical practical issue, uh, knowing what show could show up in your area is extremely important, and the only way to find those things out is to attend your educational seminars, to read your trade publications, to read your journals, and to learn this material yourself, and as well as being able to transfer that to your field people, the people that are working for you out in the field that may not have as much of an educational background as you do, but yet you cannot be everywhere at the same time. and the your employees are an extension of your business out there so by teaching them what to look for the differences are extremely are extremely important here in the Chicago area uh, one we were involved in finding a couple of the uh, new infestations of both the Asian longhorn beetle and the emerald ash borer simply by talking about these insects to our staff and they were able to identify suspicious plant materials that later on were confirmed to be uh, infested with these two insects outside of an area where they hadn't been found before. So that communication and that education part is extremely important. and. One of the things that we think of is that a lot of us aren't expecting, I'm going to, can you move me on to the next slide? It should be saying detection of the invasive insects. Is that what it's got? Is that what we've got on the there screen? You go. You're, yep, I think you're on your second slide then with detection. Of okay. The yeah, because it's. I want to advance the next one and we'll handle that for you. Okay. All right. I'll do that. So, um, I've always tell our people that you're going to see 20% of the problems 80% of the time out there, and a lot of us aren't going out looking at plant materials in the landscape expecting that we're going to run into something that we've never seen before or that perhaps you know is is a completely different insect or disease in 
this particular area. And the only way to know that is to really be on your toes and not necessarily just because you don't recognize something out there to blow it off and think, well, you know, it's just something that I don't I don't know about and somebody else does because you may have to ask yourself that question is this am I looking at something that I've only heard about or read about and never actually seen it face to face and when it comes down to it those of us that are working with trees on a day-to-day -day basis and looking at so many different plant materials compared to everybody else we're the ones that are going to find these pests when they do show up and it's one of our primary responsibilities to be able to to fill that role so if you could move me to the next slide please so when you see something that you know this looks odd this looks different than what I think I may have seen before you want to confirm your suspicions you want to you have a suspicion you may want to go and oftentimes there are individual websites that are specifically addressing any of these particular insects because they're a big enough thing and as we learn more and more about them there's more and more information that becomes available so uh, there are sites that are totally developed to the Asian longhorn beetle that they are totally developed to Florida whiteflies that are totally developed to uh, thousand cankers disease of walnut all these things are out there uh, for us to use the internet is a is a wonderful thing myself being 60 years old I can't imagine what I have had back when I was a kid uh, if I had all this information that was just available to me over the uh, over the over the internet it's an extremely important part of of being able to recognize and detect these new invasive insects out there on the front line so if you have a suspicion you want to reference these subjects and then kind of check your suspicions against the facts we just don't want to assume that hey we've got this particular problem we want to go out and we want to look and see do the symptoms and signs that I see in the field uh, are they what I should expect if I was looking at this particular pest or disease because you know we do want to double check and and it's an excellent way to learn yourself as well as things to teach other folks so if you could advance me on to the next slide and then we've got to once we've kind of got that idea that we're pretty confident that this could be something different or this could be something new or this could be something out of the ordinary then we want to go forward and we want to contact our Department of Agriculture you want to let them know what you think you're seeing they get a lot of calls from a lot of people that hear something uh, over the media and think they've got this particular insect but they're going to listen to us a little bit closer because we're dealing with these pests on an everyday basis but you do want to have the facts that build your case and so by double checking against your references and being able to explain to the people on the phone at the, your at your local um, you know extension agency you're going to be able to communicate why you believe this is going to be this why, why you believe this is what I think it is and then depending on those circumstances uh, they'll let you know how to proceed I've had them tell me that we'll be right out there to check that out or telling me that well we kind of know it's in this particular area uh, thanks for calling us but 
you know, we might let our nursery inspectors know that there's been a report of this particular insect, but we know it's kind of in the area, therefore uh, we're not too concerned about it. You don't really know what response you may get, but the idea is to let them make that decision as opposed for you to make an assumption that may turn out to be incorrect. All right, can you advance me to the next slide? If you get a confirmation that you are dealing with some type of an invasive insect, something that's new to your particular area, you may not necessarily have a choice of what to do depending on what that pest could be. Your Department of Agriculture may take over the entire situation depending on, on what it is. Jim was talking a little bit about, you know, some of the frustrations he was facing in dealing with some of these different insects. So you don't you may not have control over the situation when you're dealing with these uh, regulatory type pests because it could be a small thing, it could be a big thing, uh, depending on the situation. So in many cases, we may have to defer to the or defer to the regulatory agencies. They may come in and destroy the plants, um, and you may think, well, this isn't exactly a good thing for my client if uh, we find this pest and then they come in and destroy my client's plants, but. You know, once again, it's better to know that something is out there and operating than to let this particular population continue to increase, which may become a bigger issue in the future. The other thing that you may kind of run into is just because an invasive insect is new for you, it may not be old stuff for somebody else in a different part of the country. Uh, we look at Japanese beetles, we look at emerald ash borer, hemlock oleodelgid, some of these insects, why they may be new to you, other parts of the country have been dealing with these things uh, perhaps for decades. And so every time a new insect hits a new area, there's all this big scurry about what do we do, or in many cases the information uh, is pretty much available in other sources simply because other people have been dealing with it for a much longer time. So you may be able to find out the information you need just by checking in a place where the insect has been or disease has been more established for a longer period of time. Can you advance me to the next slide, please? As you formulate management options, you may have to consider regulatory aspects of this particular insect. In a lot of cases, just because an insect is exotic or outside the area, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to require different management uh, techniques compared to a native insect that is very closely related. A uh, flat-headed boar, uh, regardless of where it comes from, can kind of act like a flat-headed boar. There can be differences in how aggressive they are or what their host range may be or how their life cycle may change from your native similar insects because it's coming from a vastly different geographic area. But still, there are similarities there. Uh, there may be regulatory issues depending on what your state laws are. Some states may require uh, special uh, labeling of pesticides depending on what the state regulations are. You may be dealing with uh, interpretations of the Federal Insecticide and Fungicide and Rodenticide Act. Uh, you may have Section 18. Uh, declarations or Section 24C declarations. These are legal things that we in the practitioner side uh, must follow in order to be compliant with our state pesticide laws. So you're going to be able to go back to the websites and be able to check and see if there are, are any particular regulatory issues that may deal with some of these pests. And uh, we, of course, we ran into it with emerald ash borer that even though a label might say that this particular material was was labeled for use for flat-headed bores, and the emerald ash borer is a flat-headed bore, but because it was a regulatory test, 
uh, the labels kind of specifically had to state emerald ash bore. So there were some of these things about, well, what is legal and what is not legal. And when a new insect pops up, it may take some interpretation by your uh, state regulatory authorities to get a ruling on what actually may be legal and what may not be legal. And we, we do have to uh, work within those guidelines. All right, so if you want to move on to my final slide, which is simply a summary slide. So for those of us in the practitioning area, uh, we want to know what invasive insects may show up in our area. We want to confirm our suspicions if we suspect something by comparing against the known facts. We want to contact our Department of Ag or Provincial Department of Agriculture and follow their recommendations with uh, how to proceed. And then, if allowable, check references for suggested management strategies and then formulate those management strate strategies for our clients in accordance with proper plant health care and integrated pest, ma pest management guidelines. So I think with that, um, I can bring my part of the presentation to a close and we can kind of deal with some questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Rex. That was, uh, that was excellent. Um, for all the attendees, if you um, have questions, please um, type them into the question, the Q&A box, and we will field those. Um, we do have a few questions that were previously submitted, and I have some questions too, so um, we'll get to those first then. Um, one question, I guess, Jim, I'll direct this one to you, even though you both probably could answer it. Um, we had a, a previously submitted question about soil temperatures for applications. You want to address that, Jim? I can, sure. In my opinion, the soil temperatures are not as important as the, the plant or the transpiration of the plant. So uh, in other words, if, you're gonna, it's, if I'm assuming since it's soil temperatures, we're talking about drenches or, or some other kind of soil application of some sort, and if, you, if that's true, and if it's in the landscape, literally uh, it's not going to matter so much as far as the temperature goes of the soil what's going to matter is, is getting it to the plant or protecting the plant. So, uh, so, the, so I could go through a number of insecticides. Let me just give you two. One would be if we use carbaryl, carbaryl needs to have a good pH of the, of the water when you mix it in the tank. And then when you spray it, if it's cooler, it's not, it's, it's not going to have any effect. If you use a pyrethroid insecticide, so now you're going to drench with bifenthrin instead or spray with bifenthrin, now that the, the it's well known that the pyrethroids actually work better when it's cooler than it is when it's warmer, uh, but those are all just they're they're pretty much a, a, a subjective uh, measures. If we're looking at the neonicotinoids and you want to know whether you're going to drench the plant, whether it's going to get up into the tree or into your landscape and so on, it's, it has a lot more to do with the transpiration of the plant. So the soil has to be well wetted already. And the tree has to be in the tree or plant has to be in good shape already and transpiring. Uh, so when you do put the application in, it's going to get into the roots and move its way up to the top of the plant. If it's a dry area and if it's not being wet at all, the, and there's no transpiration going on, there's there's not going to be any uptake or very little uptake. And the difference between the Dinotefran and imidacloprid is pretty significant as well. Dinotefran is very soluble in water and will get into roots and get into the plant very, very quickly, whereas imidacloprid is going to bind with organic matter. So it depends on the soil composition and the, the plant that it's going into more, than, again, than the temperature uh, during the application. That's just uh, my opinion on it. Okay, great. Rex, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, we, I would agree in that the soil moisture content is probably more important than the actual temperature for those soil for those soil type applications. Um, the the materials are fairly stable for the season, at least for the season, and so even if you might get them in when there may not be a lot of you know because the soils are clue, or are, are cooler uh, as things come along and the materials are still there, they'll be uptaken. And it's, it's mainly that idea, how fast do they move up? How quickly do you have to lead the actual insect that you're concerned with to make sure that 
the the chemical and the stage of the tree and the stage of the insect all meet at the same time. Okay, great. Um, we got a couple of um, pest specific or spe questions about specific pests. Um, one question was, and uh, Jim, maybe you can address this. Any known treatment for rose rosette? Okay, rose rosette is caused by an aerophyid mite. I need to I'll pull something up on my computer here. Okay, I got it. Uh, an aerophyid mite, very, very tiny mite, nothing like a spider mite. doesn't have eight legs. It has four legs, it's, and it's super tiny. It can only be seen with a microscope, and it transmits a disease into the roses. So you've got a combination of, the, of a pest mite and a disease. The only way you can deal with that is a, in a preventative measure. Because if you once the mite is on there and it transmits a disease, you're not going to fix that plant. You're going to essentially going to have to throw it away. So you're going to have to preventatively treat the plants. Now, I have a couple of options for preventative treatments of the aerophyids. We have found that that there's four products that or three products that work absolutely really well: uh, Carborel, uh, Spiromesophen, and Spirotetramat work really, really well on preventative treatments uh, for the aer an aerophyid mite. And there's no real good curative method. Uh, there are some products that will cure a plant of the aerophyid if you cut all the damaged aerophyid damaged tissue off with the mites and then spray effectively to cure it. But if it's got the disease, it's not going to help at all. Uh, if it's got the mite, you can fix the mite, but you're not going to be able to fix the disease. So that's the best way to answer that for the uh, for the area of fines. For, for Rose Rosette. Okay, great. Yeah, my understanding is is that that, uh, that disease can actually sp spread to adjacent plants through, uh, through the root systems if they happen to be grafted together. So that's another reason to actually get an infested plant out of the landscape. And and the mites can actually move through the air, can be blown. Through the air, the yeah, they're wind, they can be windblown, which is kind of hard to, you know, so it, it is interesting how many of these insects can be blown around uh, on air currents. Hmm, that is interesting. A, a similar question, I think, because it touches on preventive treatments. Um, we have a question about boars and plum trees. A, is there a better way to detect if the tree has them besides waiting for damage to appear? And B, should they just be treated in the spring no matter what? Uh, the, the question regarding plums and borers, you know, if, depending on, you know, what type, of course, it's, you know, what type of borer are we talking about if we're thinking of that we're looking at some of the you know, our fruit plums versus ornamental plums. We even if we're dealing with the same insect, say we're dealing with one of the peach tree borers, which are moths, uh, dealing with them in a on a fruit tree versus dealing with them on an ornamental tree may require different compounds. So that's once again proper identification of the two of the of the issue is important. Uh, in many cases on on plums, there are also some canker diseases, such as Botryosphera canker, that can oftentimes be mistaken for uh, boar injury because both the bores and the canker can result in that gummy material being exuded from the trunks. And so, once again, it's important to know are we actually dealing with a bore versus a disease? Sometimes the two are working. Together, there are they may both be present at the same time. If we're dealing with bores, we usually have some type of frassy material, a combination of sawdust or frass uh, being evident somewhere along the line, depending on the type of bore that it can be. And even with the clear wing bores, either peach tree bore or lesser peach tree bore, that could both be present. Uh, peach tree borer has one generation per year. Lesser peach tree borer can have two generations per year. So they can be, and their their timings of treatments can be a little bit 
different. By using pheromone traps, you may be able to identify when the particular insect is present. Um, off the top of my head, I believe each of those bores requires a different pheromone, so you'd have to have two different traps to monitor for both of those species. But the, the peach tree bores are pretty common up here in the northern Midwest, and it could be either, either one of them. Lesser peach tree borer tends to work on the higher parts of the plant in, in branch crotches and some of the upper parts of the trunk. And peach tree borer tends to work on the lower portions of the trunk, even down to ground level or perhaps even below ground. OK, great. Jim, did you have anything to add? Now, let me add that you know, the, a lot of these borers, there will be some indication that they're in the, in the plant. Uh, if you watch the trunk and the branches carefully, you'll be able to see raised areas that you would suspect being potentially uh, some, a, a borer that's in there. And the only way to really find that out is literally cut a little bit of, uh, of the, the trunk of the uh, bark away and see if there's frass or the powder uh, that Rex was talking about uh, that might fall out the, the galleries that the borer is making, but but that's that does I don't know that that answers the question quite real well. In other words, is there a way to detect them in the tree before that damage occurs? I doubt it very strongly unless you've got some very sophisticated equipment. That means that it would have to be a preventative measure to keep those borers from uh, initially attacking the tree. And that can be accomplished in a couple of ways. Of course, there's, there are sprays that you can do that with. And, and Rex is right. You've got to get the right stuff. Uh, if it's a fruit tree, you're going to use a different product than you're going to use for a landscape tree. That's by law. And then, you know, using these products, uh, you could use a, a paint as well uh, or a method to, to wart them off. An IPM method would be to use a paint to cover the bark so the beetles can't lay their eggs and chew through into the, into the cambium layer. But preventative is about the only way to go uh, with, that, with that kind of a, 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 a pest. OK, great. And we just have a couple more minutes here. But I, I have a question. Um, Jim, you being a, an extension person, and Rex, you being a, a more specialized tree company, I have a feeling that you guys sometimes get called in to do cleanup jobs on, on you know, things that other companies might have um, done wrong. So I guess first um, I'll, I'll ask you, Rex, is there like, you know, what's the biggest mistake that you see just an average landscape contractor making when, when they're the ones that are coming in to, um, to treat the trees initially? Is there one thing you would point out? Yeah, probably the most horrific things that you can see are is a contractor mixing, getting mixing chemicals, specifically getting a, a contact herbicide mixed up with some other plant with with a insecticide or a fungicide. Um, we've just seen some devastating effects to you know simple mistakes such as grabbing the wrong container, making the assumption that you grabbed one thing and you actually grabbed something else. Uh, those are those are probably the most dramatic things that we've that we've seen, and uh, you know it, it's that's why you know you talk about separating products and labeling products properly and not using putting materials from one container into another container when there's not labeled with multiple people involved. Uh, as sometimes happens in a in a commercial firm, but that's that really is the biggest thing that we've seen. And how about you, Jim? Do you have a uh, on that? Yeah, the the most common thing I've seen here, and this would be with invasives or a regular mans landscape work, and Rex alluded to, to this already, I think, in his presentation, and that is, I am amazed at the number of people that will spray a product on, on a pest and they don't know what they've sprayed. They haven't identified the pest. And by they, they're spraying things like, um, they're spraying a miticide on an aphid that's parasitized. That's the, that's the kind of things that I've seen in the environment here. Uh, spray and spray and spray and then they'll bring a sample in and say, well, what is this? I can't kill it. And it's, it's the wrong, well, you're spraying the wrong thing. <laughs> you're not going to kill it. 
that's probably one of the most common things I've seen, the most common problems I've seen here. So the answer to that would be identify first, <laughs> spray second. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because even you make assumptions about you know they're both bores, but different bores work extremely different. You know, they, they have emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle. You know their their biology, their effects. They're they're just totally different. They're totally different in their behavior and management and 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 how you how you deal with them. Okay, great. Well, we're right at our time, so um, if we will we will close on that. Um, make sure you identify the pest before you spray it. I think that's a good a good thing to to leave with. So, just want to say thank you again to both of our speakers, Jim Besky from um, University of California and Rex Bastian from the Care of Trees, and and thank you one more time to our sponsor, Safari Insecticide. Joelle. Yeah, thanks again uh, for attending this webinar. Um, a recording will be posted on the Landscape Management website and will be emailed to you two weeks from today. Uh, please visit the Landscape Management website for future events like this. And thanks for attending and have a nice afternoon. Thank you, everyone.